in the early 1920s, a method for relating classical and quantum properties was discovered. Hidden in the formalism was something unexpected, a set of mathematical entities known as virtual oscillators. They were not real in any physical sense, nothing actually oscillated, but somehow they correctly predicted how atoms absorb and emit light. This abstraction would quietly pave the way for quantum mechanics. This video is part of my series on the road to Heisenberg's matrix formulation of quantum mechanics. Make sure to check the previous videos for context. To summarize, in previous videos, I show you how Einstein introduced probabilities and discovered that forcing Planck's radiation law to be consistent with Bohr's atomic model requires the existence of a new type of interaction between light and matter called stimulated emission, which is also the basis of the laser. Then I presented the classical theory of dispersion and, last time, how Rudolf Ladenburg proposed to use Einstein's probabilities to obtain a quantum version of dispersion and any other optical phenomena. This is the formula found by Ladenburg for the density of resonant electrons producing dispersion of light. And, as I mentioned at the end of the video, the indices on the right-hand side reveal that something is missing in this relation. The index k denotes the state of the atom that we are investigating. Therefore, the left-hand side should also have this index. The index j denotes a generic state to which the atomic transition takes place after absorbing light. Since the index j can be any state higher than k, we must consider all possibilities by summing over the index j. If this step is unclear, think about this as probabilities. The light absorption can take place to the state right above k or to a state higher and so on. Therefore, the probability of any state k transitioning into j is the sum of the probabilities for all values of j greater than k. This was already observed by Ladenburg in his 1921 paper. Following his investigation, Ladenburg invited his friend Fritz Reiche, the theorist who regularly visited his lab with Max Born, to join him on a more rigorous treatment of the method. In a paper published in July 1923, they presented a detailed discussion in which they were careful with the indices. Their most important result was the realization that the sum over all the states j represents a mathematical characterization of the behavior of the atom. In fact, they discovered that Ladenburg's description hides a profound concept, and this is the main message of this video. In his quantum interpretation, there is no mention of how the electrons move or how they are bound to each atom. Note that by replacing the resonant frequency nu k by the transition frequencies nu j k, the two indices indicate that the frequency is a property of two atomic levels rather than being a property of an electron in a particular orbit. The physical atom is effectively replaced by a representation of oscillations. And this representation is what will allow Heisenberg removing electron orbits from quantum mechanics. I insist that these oscillators are not real electrons moving back and forth at their resonant frequency, but just the conceptual representation of these oscillations. Ladenburg and Reicher call them substitute oscillators. I cannot stress enough how important this concept is. Nothing is really vibrating, but the mathematics describing the atom with all its energy levels is similar to the mathematics of a collection of classical oscillators. As an analogy, you have probably heard the joke about explaining spin. Imagine a ball that is rotating, except it is not a ball and is not rotating. I personally really like this joke because it reflects the idea of a mathematical description of a concept that must not be taken literally. The electron is not a spinning ball, but the mathematics of quantum spin is similar to the mathematics of a classical spinning ball. Something equivalent can be said about Ladenburg's substitute oscillators. 
imagine the electrons at their energy levels as oscillating at the end of a spring, except it is not a spring and it is not oscillating. I have to admit that the first time that I read Lattenberg's paper, I thought that his breakthrough was using Einstein's coefficients to model his dispersion electrons. Although this was a great innovation, quickly adopted by all physicists, his most profound discovery was the existence of these substitute oscillators. Niels Bohr called this a very interesting and promising idea, and in the summer of 1924, gave them a more catchy name, virtual oscillators. Lattenberg's method made these virtual oscillators the general way of describing light-matter interactions, even beyond dispersion. In fact, as I will show you soon, Heisenberg's matrix mechanics is a quantum theory of virtual oscillators. How about you? Did you hear about virtual oscillators before? Let me know in the comments. In the past few videos, we have studied the refractive index in depth as the reaction of electrons in a material to a passing electromagnetic wave. There is a more general way of characterizing light-matter interactions via electric polarization. When a collection of positive and negative charges are placed in an electric field, the electric force makes the charges move apart at distance x, inducing a so-called electric dipole moment, which is defined as the product of the electric charge and this distance x that the charges are displaced. In simple materials, the dipole moment induced is proportional to the electric field, where the proportionality constant is called the polarizability of the material, and denoted by alpha. During the second half of the 1800s, the Dutch physicist Hendrik Lorentz and the Danish mathematician Ludwig Lorentz independently discovered a relation between polarizability and refractive index. This is called the Lorentz-Lorentz equation. Just in case you have studied electrodynamics, the Lorentz gauge condition is named after Lorentz, not Lorentz. For gases at normal pressure, we can approximate the denominator n squared plus 2 to 3, from where we can write the Lorentz-Lorentz equation in this form. Replacing the refractive index that we derived in previous videos, we find the polarizability to be this. The ratio between the dispersion electrons and the total number of electrons is denoted by f. From the last video, you will recognize that the factors f correspond to the ratios measured by Lattenberg and Loria in their experiments on anomalous dispersion. Wolfgang Pauli referred to these factors as the strength of the oscillator. Writing the dipole as the sum of dipoles for each k, we find this relation. Using the result derived by Lattenberg, the quantum version of the strength for a given state k is this, where from now on we will assume non-degenerate states, so that the quantum electric dipole moment for an electron in the state k is this expression. Lattenberg did not include this formula in his paper, but all these terms are there. Notice that Lattenberg and Reiche made the assumption that the state k is the lowest possible state. However, if you want a completely general expression, we have to consider that the state k can also transition to lower states. This extension of Lattenberg's formula was introduced by Hendrik Kramers, a former student of Paul Ehrenfest, who was now Niels Bohr's assistant in Copenhagen. Kramers submitted these results as a brief letter to Nature in March 1924, but provided no proof and his motivation was not very convincing. The first term is just Lattenberg's result, but the new term was received with skepticism. The main issue was the negative sign, which Kramers justified as an analogy to the negative absorption introduced by Einstein. Also note that the indices appear in reverse order. There is a famous letter in Nature by Gregory Bright calling this second negative term somewhat dissatisfying, which is a very polite way to say that this term has to be better justified. Kramers responded in a follow-up letter that the negative term was justified by Bohr's correspondence principle, but only provided an outline of a demonstration. 
two Americans that made significant contributions to quantum theory in these days were John Slater and John Van Vleck. Slater is a familiar name to anybody who has used Slater determinants for building multi-electron wave functions or studied ferromagnetism using the Beta-Slater curve. Van Vleck is regarded as the father of modern magnetism and shared the 1977 Nobel Prize in Physics with Philip Anderson, one of his students. In late 1923, Slater got his doctorate from Harvard and obtained a fellowship for a stay at Bohr's Institute in Copenhagen, where he worked with Bohr and Kramers. During the summer of 1924, in a private letter to Van Vleck, Slater wrote, Kramers hasn't got much done. You perhaps notice his letter to nature on dispersion, the formulas, and except for that, he has not done anything. For many, Kramer's formula looked more like a guess rather than a formal result. You should keep in mind that what we call old quantum theory was not really a theory, but rather a collection of ad hoc rules used to restrict the solutions of a classical problem. Most of these rules were motivated by experiments, influenced by clever guessing, and later guided by Bohr's correspondence principle, which states that in the limit of large quantum numbers, the quantum quantities approach their classical values. But instead of guessing new quantum rules and showing that solutions correctly approximate the classical limit, a complete quantum theory should allow defining quantum equations for a physical system and lead to a systematic method to solve the problem. For this, the main driver continued to be the correspondence principle. What everyone was searching for was a way to sharpen the correspondence principle and turn it into a formal method. In the summer of 1924, Max Born published a paper simply titled About Quantum Mechanics, which is the first time that the name quantum mechanics was used. This was an attempt towards a final theory of the atom. It contains remarkable results, but it failed to provide a complete picture of the interactions of atoms and light. One of the key results was a relationship between classical derivatives and quantum differences. Born proposed that the way to turn classical mechanics into quantum mechanics was by transforming all differential equations into finite differences. This worked in some cases. For instance, it allowed Born to confirm Kramer's dispersion formula. It turns out that Kramer's was right, and the negative second term with reversed indices is indeed necessary to satisfy the correspondence principle. In the fall of 1924, John van Vleck presented a generalization of the correspondence principle for absorption and found, just like Born, that the negative term introduced by Kramers was indeed required. Van Vleck used advanced techniques that I cannot summarize in a brief video. There is a whole course called Analytical Mechanics that every physics student has to take to become proficient in so-called action angle variables. However, I have a very simplified, hand-wavy way of explaining Van Vleck's method. Again, this is not how Van Vleck did it, but I hope it will give you an idea of the key concepts. Imagine an atom in the energy level k, and light of frequency nu jk hits this atom. Let's see how the state of the atom can change. For j greater than k, if the energy of the incident light matches the energy gap to a higher state j, then the light quantum is absorbed, leaving the atom with more energy in the state j. In this diagram, please do not think of the orange dot as the electron jumping from one orbit to another. The orange dot only represents the current state of the atom. The whole point of virtual oscillators is that we don't need to think about electrons in orbits. But what would happen if j is less than k? In other words, j is a level of less energy than the original level k. If the energy of the incident light matches the energy gap to the lower state j, then radiation stimulates the atom to transition to the lower state. The initial quantum is effectively absorbed and two new light quanta are emitted. Notice that the original light quantum is absorbed as conventional absorption in the first case, 
and as a stimulated emission in the second. Although this second process is an emission reaction, it can be interpreted as a negative absorption, because the original quantum is absorbed by leaving the atom with less energy than the initial. This is the negative absorption that Kramers mentions in his letter and the reason for the minus sign in his formula. From here we can write the quantum current density of each process as the transition energy times the transition rate. We use the B coefficient for absorption in the first process and the B coefficient for stimulated emission in the second. Just as before, we sum over all possible states J. The first process can only happen for J greater than K, whereas the second only occurs for J less than K. Finally, we write the B coefficients in terms of the A coefficient using Einstein's relations. We can now calculate the oscillator's strength following Ladenburg's method. Plugging our result and simplifying common factors, we get this, from where we can finally determine the quantum electric dipole moment as before. Putting everything together, we rediscover Kramer's dispersion formula. There are many things to be said about this formula. One important aspect is the key role that the virtual oscillators play. Alfred Landé referred to these objects as an orchestra of virtual oscillators. Another important feature is the structure of this formula. Just forget for a second about the meaning of each symbol and just pay attention to the structure. If you have studied quantum mechanics, you are familiar with the so-called canonical commutation relation. If you don't know this, no worries. Just notice that we have two labels minus the same labels in the opposite order. I will soon show you the true origin of the famous commutator, but I hope that you can see how this is beginning to take shape. This formula was eventually tested in dispersion experiments in the summer of 1928. The title of this paper asserts the confirmation of negative absorption in the form of changes in the refractive index of electrically excited neon gas. All these experiments were led by no other than Rudolf Ladenburg. Finally, I want you to notice how many concepts come together in this formula. The first term came from Ladenburg's ingenious bridge between classical and quantum dispersion, discussed in the previous video. The second term is required by Bohr's correspondence principle, which we also found thanks to Einstein negative absorption, today called stimulated emission. In his groundbreaking paper on radiation of 1917, Einstein discovered negative absorption as the result of enforcing the consistency of Bohr's atomic model and Planck's radiation law. Putting all these concepts together, Ladenburg included a whimsical conclusion. The minus one in the denominator of Planck's radiation formula is a consequence of taking negative absorption into account. In his 1924 paper, Van Vleck wrote, the introduction of these virtual resonators is, to be sure, in some ways very artificial, but is nevertheless apparently the most satisfactory way of combining the elements of truth in both the classical and quantum theories. Kramers finally published a complete proof of his famous dispersion formula in early 1925, as part of a paper that he wrote at Bohr's Institute with a visitor from Göttingen. A young assistant to Max Born recently graduated from Sommerfeld's group named Werner Heisenberg. They do not explicitly mention virtual oscillators, but they are there. And as I will show you in a future video, the orchestra of virtual oscillators is one of the starting points of Heisenberg's seminal paper that created quantum mechanics.